Hi guys, thank you guys for joining us. I know this isn't the most fun, loving, warm topic, but I think it's important that we all talk about it. So I'm, I'm really appreciative that you guys are here. Um, my name is Rana Mini. I am a therapist by trade. I'm an LPC, um, but I function um, as the clinical program director for a wonderful anti-trafficking organization based out here in Dallas. So we'll talk to you guys about that as well. Um, and so today we're going to talk about trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation, and complex trauma, and how all of those things are intertwined, and what the intersection of all that looks like. Um, okay, so really first off, I kind of want to hear from you guys in the idea of like what you think sex trafficking is. I admittedly, before I started really deep diving in my awareness of trafficking, had a pretty limited worldview of what that looked like. So I want to kind of just normalize for you all that um, we have a lot of myths about trafficking that's normal, that's okay, um, and that's what I'm here to kind of inform you guys about. So would love to hear, um, you guys are welcome to, if you guys have a question or anything, just let me know. Um, you, I'll answer your questions kind of throughout the, the speaking engagement. So want to hear what thoughts, what you've heard, what information is kind of floating out in the world about sex trafficking. You guys are welcome to say it out loud too. Ashley, do you mind kind of reading aloud who's saying what in the chat so I can make sure that I don't miss it? Yes, of course. So far, I'm not you seeing so anything. If you got, oh, here we go. My thoughts are that it, that it is modern day slavery, but no one wants to call it that. Mm -hmm. um, forcing people to perform sexual acts. Yeah, that's exactly right. So yes, so absolutely yes to all of those things. And I think what feels really important for me to to kind of drill into any opportunity that I get to talk about this topic is that this idea of trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation is happening here in Dallas. It's happening where you live. It's happening um, in our neighborhoods and it is far more common than we realize. Um, it is essentially the story of a person who has experienced a lot of abuse as a child and that abuse just continues to increase their vulnerability for further abuse down the trajectory of their livelihood their livelihood, right? So it's important to understand that when we are talking about this topic, we are not talking about blaming the victim, but the having a better understanding of why people make the choices that they make and what leads them to be in this trajectory of life. Um, this is about acknowledging the, the lasting impacts of what childhood abuse and childhood sexual abuse looks like. And um, when I think about the person who's impacted with sex trafficking, I think so much about the little girl who maybe was abused by her uncle or by a father or by a neighbor and makes an outcry of abuse and no one really hears her story. Um, and that kind of leads her to the decision that home is not safe, where I live is not safe, and anything is better than what is happening here. And so that leads her to running away. And then inevitably she is um, met or intercepted by somebody who exploits her, right? And so that leads her on the trajectory of domestic violence and sex trafficking. But all of the things that we talk about start at an early age, right? Um, if anybody has ever seen the movie Taken, that is talked about a lot in the realm of sex trafficking. And while that happens, absolutely, it is far less um, of the common in sex trafficking than what we know to be true. Okay. Okay. Um, we talked a little bit about what kind of thoughts you guys had and what you have heard about sex trafficking. Ultimately, the goal is that the earlier the intervention, the better we can impact the trajectory of her life. I'm going to speak, um, I'm going to say she, her, not because all people who are impacted, about, uh, impacted with sex trafficking are identifying as female, but I work at an agency where we only provide services for people who identify as female. And so that is why that language is there. Um, so all people are impacted by this. Okay, so sex trafficking myths that we often hear is that trafficking is defined by the crossing of state or national borders. We know that that is not true because of what I shared earlier. Trafficking can happen in our own backyards. Literally a child can be trafficked in their own home, the home that they've grown up grown up in and have lived in their whole lives. 
and it has nothing to do with the movement um, for it to be trafficking. So another myth that we usually hear is that it is always or usually a violent crime. It can be, absolutely, but we know that abusers and traffickers use lots of different ways to hold power and control over their victims and the survivors of um, sex trafficking. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a violent crime. If the trafficked person consented to be in their initial situation, then it cannot be human trafficking or against their will because they knew better. Um, we know that people make decisions, especially when it comes to trafficking and sexual exploitation, out of survival. And so people are, um, I think, a lot about like a hard option and an even harder option is essentially what these girls and these women are faced with. And so in the beginning, it is not always this perfect informed consent of like, this is actually what your day to day is going to look like. The beginning can look like, oh, I'm looking for shelter. I'm looking for love and belonging. And this person is offering me that. And then slowly but surely, um, it kind of advances, right? Only four nationals can be victim of trafficking. Yes, there's trafficking happening across the whole world. And sometimes people are moved from country to country, but plenty of US citizens are trafficked every single day. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about just the definitions of what is sex trafficking, because I know that there's lots kind of floating in the world about trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation. So we'll go over that. So what is sex trafficking? Sex trafficking is essentially when someone uses force, fraud, or coercion to cause a commercial sex act with an adult or causes a minor to commit a commercial sex act. So if there is involvement of a minor committing a commercial sex, sex act, it is automatically sex trafficking. It doesn't need to have force, fraud, or coercion. Um, to fit that definition. So what is a commercial sex act? A commercial sex act um, is essentially prostitution, pornography, and sexual performances done in exchange for anything of value, such as money, food, shelter, or clothes. So one of the caveats I'll put for this is that here at New Friends New Life, um, when a woman or a girl um, reaches out to us or we get linked in with them, one of the questions that we make sure to ask in their phone screening is have you ever had an experience with survival sex? Because so many of the girls and the women that we um, meet and receive services from us do not identify, do not self-identify as human trafficking victims. Because at the end of the day, if the person that I met who, you know, I felt very clear was my boyfriend has initiated this um, this trade process for me, then I might not identify as a victim of sex trafficking, right? And so what feels really important to us is that we are not missing people who are absolutely in the sex industry and are being impacted by sex trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation, but necessarily don't have the language for that yet, right? So it's important to think about it from that context too, that survival sex. So I use something like, um, has there ever been a time in your life where you felt like you needed to have sex in order to get your needs met? to get food on the table, to put a roof over your head. And if we did not have that question, I you know, feel would feel really worried about the amount of girls and women that qualify for our services and need our services and wouldn't get those. So that's important to think about as well. What is child sex, sexual exploitation and trafficking? When a person under the age of 18 is sexually abused or violated in exchange for anything of value, such as money, power, or status, Child sex trafficking occurs when a third party, a trafficker or a pimp, profits from the act. When a minor is the victim, force, fraud, or coercion needs not to be present. So I'm going to talk about these women, these girls, victim survivors. I'll use those term, the terminology interchangeably sometimes um, as that comes down to self-identification. But we'll talk about them in the context of each being the last version of the other in they're experiencing being their experience and their life being on a spectrum. Okay. Um, the victim of commercial sexual exploitation of a child is the DV victim, is the sex trafficking victim. All of those things are inextricably linked. If we are not able to provide an intervention and kind of reroute the trajectory of her life. Okay. Commercial sexual exploitation of a child, um, sexual activity involving a child in exchange for something of value or promise thereof to the child or another person or person. So it can actually be, um, the promise can be made to the child. It can also be to the parent, to a caregiver, to a neighbor. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the context of just to that child. And it is treating a child as a commercial and sexual object 
it is absolutely a form of violence against children. So the caveat that I will allow um, or that I will talk about a little bit is the terminology of child prostitution. There is no such thing as child prostitution um, because there's no such thing as non-consensual sex with a minor. So that is um, commercial sexual exploitation of a child if it involves those things. So, okay, so sex trafficking is on the up and up. Um, the, the triad of this is essentially there is a trafficker or a pimp um, who exploits the victims to earn revenue. And then they then sell those victims for trade or profit or an item of value, which then fuels the market by the Johns and the buyers. And then in order to fuel that demand, then people need to be exploited and sold for profit in order to continue this triad, right? So we cannot um, end sex trafficking without ending the demand of trafficking. Okay, so traffickers find um, victims everywhere. I think uh, over the last few years, it has become really evident in the trafficking world more now than ever that the internet is being used as a way to um, entice children and manipulate children. I have heard um, Roblox, Minecraft, all these little apps that children will use. Um, there are traffickers and, and buyers on the platform. That is not to scare us into thinking that like our children cannot have any freedom, but it is something to be mindful of, especially given that over the last few years since the pandemic, there's about a 20 to 30% reported increase in a online presence for trafficking and sexual exploitation. So yes, traffickers find victims everywhere. Um, through clubs, bars, social networks, school, neighborhoods, online social media. Um, we even had a youth a month or two ago share that she was at a gas station, just kind of buying a snack and pumping gas, and that the person behind her in line um, essentially started a conversation with her and for the next couple of weeks was trying to solicit her, right, into what's going on, what are your needs, um, I can get you this apartment, you can live in it, right, so what we know is kind of the start of a typical story for somebody that is youth and is being trafficked. So assessing what that child's needs are and trying to meet that need um, from a really maladaptive abusive platform. Okay, so yes, we don't talk about abuse in the context of just the women that we think of maybe that are chained up or you know white van kind of premise. It's not that. It can be, yes, of course. But that is a very atypical presentation of what this kind of truly looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. It is more, somebody has a need that needs to be met. And there is somebody that is um, trying to meet that need in order to gain power and control. So the things that we know that traffickers will use to kind of lure the promise they're up for these women and these girls is protection, love, adventure, shelter, opportunity. So back to that kind of that story of the child who has experienced a lot of childhood sexual abuse or feels like her voice is not heard, feels like she has made multiple outcries and nobody's hearing her. Um, what we know about children that run away is that they are running away from something um, and are running, are trying to run towards something else. And that towards something else typically is protection, love, belonging, shelter, um, financial opportunity, some type of opportunity there that did not exist in the home. Um, mo most women don't go into trafficking, no trafficking knowingly, right? It starts little and then it escalates from there. So trafficking across the globe. So this kind of just paints the picture. Um, this was the most recent um, graph that we have that, that kind of shows us what it looks like. I can imagine that this is far higher now, um, especially given that we've, as a collective society, lived through a pandemic and that changes people's needs um, and exploitation increases, right? Okay, the cost of human trafficking. Again, my prediction is that this is now higher if there was more recent research, but it is a $150 billion worldwide, worldwide trade. Um, it's estimated that 71% of women and girls are the victims of this trade and that 29% are men and boys. Um, and that kind of breaks down for you 54% sexual exploitation, 38% forced labor, and 8% other purposes, which again, I believe that 
those numbers likely have changed since then, but that really kind of paints the picture for you, the gravity of this issue. This talks about Texas. So we know that Texas is um, ranks number two in the country for trafficking and um, Dallas is second um, behind Houston in the state. Okay, so sex trafficking in Dallas it's a $99 million annual profit of the sex trade in Dallas, 400 estimated number of trafficked teens on Dallas streets every single night, which is a really sombering um, stat, but really important for all of us to hear because that is the reality. We know those girls, we see those girls, um, and it it's real, it's happening. Um, and 15% of the calls to the National Trafficking Hotline originate from DFW. Okay, so... Who is she? We started talking about her a little bit, but who is the quote unquote typical child or um, woman who experiences trafficking? What does her early life look like? What is the trajectory of her life look like? And again, while this is not the um, end all be all of what trafficking looks like, the majority of the women and the girls that we serve we can conceptualize them as somewhere on this continuum. So this is the continuum of sexual abuse and of sexual exploitation of children and the commercial sexual exploitation of children as it kind of furthers along down the line. And so I think so much of that first uh, incident or experience that this child has where love and sex are linked. So oftentimes that childhood sexual abuse that starts from a really early age where those things kind of get wired together for this child. And then the continuation of that is the violation of boundaries, is the guilt and shame that she starts to feel from those experiences, is the low self-esteem that now is part of her daily living because of those experiences that she's had. And then she gets to a point where maybe she has made quite a few outcries and or the things that are happening in the home have escalated where she decides, that I'm gonna run away from home. Again, not to be um, defiant or anything like that. It's really truly like, I actually have to get away from this environment. I cannot tolerate this anymore. I don't know what is out in the world, but I do know what is inside of this home or where I live. And as a child, the thought process becomes anything else is better than this. Things are so bad and so terrible that anything has to be better than what I'm living with, right? So that's when the running away starts. She starts to experience homelessness. There is kind of some research that says that um, children can be apprehended by a trafficker and meet a trafficker within 48 hours of them running away from home. And that risk is really terrifying, right? To think about a child being out on the streets for two days and within those two days, meet somebody who is ready to exploit her um, and kind of exploit the needs that she has against her. So I'll, I also think about like, when I think about the children in my life that I know, how terrifying it is to think about them being 12, 13, 14, and trying to survive out on the streets and the need that that creates and the vulnerability that that creates for her. And so how this kind of escalates through the trajectory of this continuum. So then she is experiencing poverty. Um, there's an unequal power dynamic if any adult kind of approaches her. And then it just builds the media influence, the demand for the sex trade. Um, if I know somebody that's already in the life, right? And there is an element of lure and appeal and romanticism that happens when the sex industry of, if I am a child who has experienced poverty and always am in a place where my needs are not being met, then this idea um, of, oh, there's this girl that works as a stripper or she's in the sex industry and she makes money fast and look at how much money she makes and it gets romanticized, right? And so if I am from an environment where there are so many needs of mine that need to be met that are not, and I'm experiencing so much hardship and suffering and poverty, not just in my home, but all around me, then yeah, the way out that feels like a really great option, right? That I can work, you know, a night or a few nights and make thousands of dollars. And I also think it's a fallacy to think that like something like that, where we can make a lot of money really quickly is not enticing to people who need their needs met and are, have been struggling on the bottom rank of Maslow's hierarchy of needs for the entirety of their life, right? 
Um, and then yes, again, the demand of the billion dollar industry can make that really enticing. And then they are then approached by recruiters or pimps and traffickers, right? The media, the music that we hear, the things that we see, I think a lot of, if you guys are like familiar with like Instagram trends and TikTok and social media, there is now this um, romanticization and this trend, it's called strip talk, stripper talk, where women talk about how much money they make in a night, right? And if I am coming from a place where I'm in desperate need of having my needs met, then that feels like the way out, right? Um, the way out doesn't feel like <clears throat> I can go make minimum wage at a fast food chain, right? That doesn't feel like, oh yeah, that feels great. And that's the thing that I wanna do. Um, so from these stats, from this, from this um, continuum, what we know is that 70 to 90% of the women that have experienced commercial sexual exploitation were sexually abused as a child. And we also know that a child's exposure to domestic violence impacts their likelihood of experiencing domestic violence themselves if they witness it in the home. And so DV domestic violence starts and ends um, by watching what is happening around us, right? And so this is what we talked about, that the child who's experienced CSEC is the child that experiences sex trafficking, is the child that experiences domestic violence in the home, and then as an adult has those experiences herself as the victim. Okay, so these stats are directly from our agency. And so the layers of trauma we know um, in our experience working with these women and girls are complex and pervasive and they start in childhood and they compound over their lives over time as their life progresses. So 69% of the women that we serve have reported a history of childhood sexual abuse. I honestly um, imagine that that is lower because if we think about a human being's experience coming into an agency for the first time and the vulnerability that requires and also the courage that that requires and assessing if there is safety in this place. So we've seen that this number actually um, changes the longer that we work with a client, right? That reporting changes. 79% um, of women reported having a history of domestic violence. So what I have learned to be true is that the anti-trafficking world and the domestic violence world have so much overlap. And so the, the women that are being treated um, and served for the impact of their uh, domestic violence and their intimate partner violence relationships are the women that are also experiencing sex trafficking. Not always, right? But there is a huge overlap because the methodology that an, an abuser uses in a domestic violence relationship is almost the same as the methodology methodology that a uh, trafficker or a pimp uses um, in the sex trafficking trade. 86% of women reported illicit or prescription drug use. That is not a shock to us because we know that when people are experiencing trauma and pervasive pain, their brain is looking for a way out. And while drugs and alcohol are not considered a healthy coping skill by any means, they are an effective coping skill. So they help people numb, distract, and tolerate and get through these really horrific experiences. So we, it's not a shock to us that that is so high. And then 67% of women reported substance use treatment, including NA or AA or a rehabilitation service. Um, also notable that 86% um, of the women that we serve report being diagnosed with a mental health diagnosis as well. Okay. Primary risk factors for commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. So that continuum of commercial sexual exploitation of children kind of started talking about that. And uh, these are kind of the, the, the research that we know tells us that these are risk factors for commercial sexual exploitation. So what I always tell parents and what I always tell providers and practitioners is that, yes, can our children be trafficked? Absolutely. Is it going to be likely somebody that just snatches them from the parking lot? No. Is this idea that, you know, we see those things, I'm sure you guys have seen them like, oh, I went to Target and somebody put this slip on my window and, you know, yes, does that happen? Sure. Is that often the way that people are recruiting for trafficking? No. It is the risks and the vulnerabilities that that child has in the home 
that will either propel her or prevent her. Um, they will either be protective factors or risk factors against sex trafficking. So when parents are concerned about, I want to make sure my child is not trafficked. I want to make sure my child does not have this terrible experience. Absolutely. And the way that we prevent that is from making impacts in the home and making sure that our children feel safe and heard and um, their needs are being met with compassion and love and um, intentionality. Okay, so um, earlier childhood sexual abuse, there's a high correlation there, chronic homelessness, four or more plus runaway in two years, um, CPS foster care involvement and or arrest history, inadequate supervision or care, inadequate food, clothing, or shelter, family and or community history of exploitation and exposure to domestic violence in the home. So we've talked a little bit about some of these things, but that four plus runaway in two years, right? We have research that tells us that that exacerbates a child's risk of being trafficked. Um, at New Friends New Life, we have the youth side and we have the adult side. So our adult side is more, um, how do we intervene now that these women have had these experiences? How do we make sure that they can heal from their trauma? They're getting the support that they deserve. And then on the youth side, the goal and the hope is that we can kind of intervene on this continuum and prevent their life from continuing down that trajectory, right? So it is prevention and then essentially aftercare, if you will. Um, and so we use a tool, it's called the see it tool on the youth side. Um, to essentially assess if a child or a youth has these risk factors. And if she has one of these risk factors, she qualifies for services on the youth side. Differently than the adult side on the adult side, in order for somebody to meet, um, to be eligible for services, they have to have an experience being in the sex industry or experience being exploited. And it can literally be a one-time incident of survival sex, or it can be years of their entire life in the, the sex industry, right? But that is how they qualify for services on the adult side. Whereas on the youth side, that is not required. A child to receive services at New Friends Life on the youth side does not need to have already been a victim of trafficking. She just needs to have a risk factor um, in order to meet criteria. So, so many of the girls that we see have experienced childhood sexual abuse or are starting to run away from home or are truant and are um, starting to kind of collect an arrest history in the juvenile detention center, right? So those are the girls that we are able to impact and serve on the youth side. And it is right based on these risk factors right here. Okay, before I continue, does anybody have any questions? If you do, you're welcome to, to ask. Okay. Okay. So yes, 70 to 90% of uh, sexually exploited children, we've already talked about have a childhood sexual abuse history, at least a hundred to 300,000 youth are at risk for commercial sexual exploitation in the United States. And at least a hundred thousand children are used in childhood sex trafficking every year in the U S the most common age of entry for a child into the sex industry, into commercial sexual exploitation is 15 to 17. They are predicting that that is actually moving um, to an earlier and earlier age, which is why we provide services from children 12 and up, um, because we know that that time period is so vital to make sure that we can either create protective factors um, or increase risk factors. And we want to make sure, right, that we can provide that community and that supports to, to add protective factors and decrease their risk factors. Okay, um, it is so much so in the context of family. So family can um, create support in a child's life or prim, uh, they can be a shield for that child or they can create a void where um, there are people whose entire goal is to meet that void as a way to, um, holds power and control and manipulate these children. Okay. Okay, so uh, these stats are also from New Friends in Life and the uh, girls that we serve. So this is more on the youth side. So youth, we consider anywhere from 12 to 22 years of age. So 80% of the girls that we serve here have run away from home. 56% of the girls that we serve have met face-to-face with someone who has targeted them online. 76% of the girls have been introduced to drugs or alcohol by age 18. And 78% of the girls have experienced physical or sexual abuse. So they are right, they are the living, breathing embodiment of those risk factors um, that we are trying to impact. 
we know that around 56% of the youth that we have served have reported already at least one inpatient stay. And we know that the earlier that intervention is made, um, a child who experiences an inpatient stay is more likely to experience more inpatient stays in their future. 86% um, of the youth that we serve have been diagnosed with a mental health diagnosis. 67% um, reported substance use already as a youth. Um, so these are just really significant statistics to think about when we think of these, these youth and these girls and these women and what that looks like going from youth to adult. Okay, so a lot of you are likely familiar with ACE scores. Um, ACE scores are the adverse childhood experiences. So for a lot of you, this might be a reminder. So the ACE study is a study done by um, Kaiser and also by the CDC. And essentially what they did is they asked um, 175,000 adults and interviewed them to figure out about their history of exposure to um, these adverse child experiences. So these are the 10 different questions that they essentially gauged for. So every time you have experienced one of these things, you say yes to these questions that scale for these 10 different things, you get a point. Um, and what they have found is that the higher the points that you have, the more likely you are gonna have long-term um, chronic medical outcomes, right? Um, medical and mental health outcomes. So these are there's a direct correlation between these scores and health outcomes. So the thing about ACE scores is that they are actually incredibly common. 67% um, um, of human beings in the United States have experienced one of these things and therefore have at least one ACE score or higher. Um, so it's, it's notable, but the more that we have, the more our risk increases. The one thing that I'm gonna touch on here, physical abuse, sexual abuse, yes, emotional abuse, all of those things, but um, our parent, a caregiver in the home or a parent in the home experiencing their own domestic violence is really significant because what that does is it changes the blueprint of love and attachment for us as a child. I think so much about domestic violence in this idea of like, yes, it does not start if, if I went, a date, went on a date with someone and they punched me in the face the first time that we went on a date, I'm not going to go on a date with them again, right? But domestic violence is not that simple, right? If abusers were intervening with children and hitting them or being physically abusive in their first few encounters, then that raises a red flag immediately, right? I think so much of domestic violence in this idea of how do you boil a frog? You don't boil a frog by boiling a hot pot, a hot pot of water and putting the frog in because the frog will jump out because they will sense that water and they will jump out. The way that you boil a frog is you put the frog in a vat of water and you increase and titrate the heat of that water. And by the time the frog understands that it is in danger, it is paralyzed and is no longer able to jump out of that vat of water. And that is sex trafficking. That is domestic violence. And that's the reality of what it looks like, right? It happens slowly and progressively over time. And before I know it, my danger has increased significantly. This person that I loved and care about and I thought was loving and safe and helpful and kind is actually the same person that's inflicting this harm on me. Okay, so yes, so sorry, the A scores, right? So these are the 10 different things that they scale from. And the higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcome. So a person with an ACE score of four or more is two times more likely to develop hepatitis. They are four times more likely to develop depression and they are 12 times more likely to experience suicidality. So a person with an ACE score of seven or more has a lifetime risk of lung cancer that's three times higher than somebody that has a zero on their ACE scores and has a three and a half times higher risk of developing heart disease, right? And this is so much of what we see in the women that we serve. So regardless of if they are in the life now or um, 
are still actively in the life or not, their risk has already increased. And so we see so many chronic pervasive health conditions. The women that we serve um, have so many medical diagnoses and are being treated for so many things because of these ACE scores, because we know there's a correlation to these things and they are the, the, the living example of that, right? Um, so yeah, it's important for us to kind of think about how this impacts the people that we are serving and the people that we are seeing. Okay, so impact of trauma on the brain. So one thing that I just want to touch on is that young people are teenagers or adolescent children. Um, their brain is not fully developed yet, right? So naturally they are working from a place of emotion and their um, critical thinking is starting to kind of amp up and come online. And so yeah, their age is not a indicator for their rational decision making. Although we might wish and will it as much as we want, we know that a their chronological age is not an indicator for their decision making. So we have to consider not only how the brain works for a child, especially somebody that is a youth and is an adolescent, versus what does that look like when we also compound the effects of trauma on their brain, right? So People who have experienced chronic and pervasive trauma during childhood are more likely to have a bigger amygdala. So a, 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 when we have a bigger amygdala, it means that that amygdala is more sensitive. When you think amygdala, think of like emotions, right? Um, they are more likely to have a smaller hippocampus. Um, that area of the brain is the part that processes trauma and emotions. So when we talk about how trauma impacts memory, this is part of that, right? Um, things don't get stored in a linear fashion when I have had traumatic things happen to me. And people who have experienced trauma are more likely to have a smaller prefrontal cortex because of the shrinking that is created over time with that trauma. And so that impacts their decision making and their critical thinking, right? And so I think of these things as like a light switch. So a person who has not experienced trauma and or has maybe experienced just single incidents of trauma over the lifespan versus that chronic nature of complex trauma, their light switch may be, it maybe takes like 10 pounds of pressure to turn on that light switch, right? Whereas somebody who has experienced chronic and pervasive trauma, that light switch is, a, is far more sensitive. So maybe it takes two pounds of pressure to kind of turn on that light switch. And that's where we see, right, the extremes of the responses. That's where we see in a youth, um, a youth is already thinking, they're not thinking, they're acting out of emotion, right? And so when a child has experienced trauma, it just amplifies that by the nth degree. The other thing that trauma impacts, and quite literally the, the way that the brain looks, is an overactive and dysregulated nervous system. So if I am a child who is experiencing trauma um, every day, all the time, then my nervous system is going to be up, 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 all the time. My new baseline is going to be far higher, right? And so what happens if I have experienced a lot of trauma and therefore my amygdala is on for longer periods of time is that my brain adapts to that new level of, um, of chronic stress, right? And so my amygdala is chronically on. And so even when I'm no longer in, in, in that danger, and that danger is not live and well in front of me, my amygdala is still constantly on. It's harder to turn that on. And I have a higher level of cortisol at all times, which is going to make me more reactive, which is going to make me, it's kind of in line with what we think about with PTSD symptoms, that hyper arousal, that constant on, that constant scanning, um, something drops and I startle, right? My startle response is higher. Those are the impacts of having an amygdala that has been on for so long of your life, right? So this is so much of what we see in youth and then also in the the women that we serve. So co-occurring risk factors are often present that make a youth vulnerable to sex trafficking in the commercial sex industry. I also think, yes, are youth naturally more vulnerable because um, they are youth? Absolutely. But if we then add the impact of trauma and we watch the compounding effect of that, then they are more likely to have experiences in the sex industry or be trafficked because of the impact that their already early childhood trauma has had on their brain. So it kind of just increases that cycle over and over again. Um, young people are making decisions out of their amygdala, right? And so that kind of becomes more sensitive and more dysregulated and more heightened 
when we add their trauma in there. Okay. Ultimately, young people are not thinking more than they are feeling. So, okay. So want to touch a little bit on the intersectionality of domestic violence and sex trafficking. I've kind of talked about it already just a bit, um, but domestic violence and sex trafficking are invariably linked. We can, if you guys are familiar with the power and control wheel, um, there is one for understanding um, the techniques, if you will, that traffickers use to hold power and control with their um, victims. And those things literally mirror one, one another we can pick apart the same things that an abuser might do in the home when there's domestic violence are often the same things that um, traffickers or pimps will use when they're attempting to keep power and control over the victims. Um, so the, the overlap is very high. We often see that the women that we serve are the same women that are in the domestic violence shelters in Dallas as well. So um, just kind of further that idea. So victims of DV and sex trafficking have similar risk factors. We can place them on that continuum of commercial sexual exploitation of children. And those things increase their vulnerability in these circumstances. So again, the person that has experienced commercial sexual exploitation is the person that experiences trafficking is, and if she has experienced trafficking, she is far more likely to experience domestic violence. So the frequency and level of physical violence survivors experience vary accordingly to several factors. Pimps who use physical dominance to maintain control are frequently violent towards their victims, and buyers perpetrate more violence on girls and women and transgender women than on men. As the experiences of violence increase, the symptoms of PTSD accumulate and build. Okay, substance abuse and trauma. So why do the women and girls who come to us have a higher rate of substance abuse? We've touched on that a little bit, but there's quite a few reasons. So C-sex survivors are many times introduced to drugs and alcohol as teenagers or children. That stat earlier was 70 to 80% of the youth that we um, serve have already been exposed to drugs or alcohol and introduced and offered that before even the age of 18. Higher levels of increased risk factors for both sex trafficking and substance abuse, such as maternal substance use, right? While that baby is in utero as well. And also just in general, mom using, right? It exacerbates my potential risk. Um, survivors may abuse drugs or alcohol willingly to cope with PTSD symptomatology. Um, I'll be mindful and intentional about the word willingly, as in it is a way to cope and tolerate um, in order to survive through those encounters. Victims are often provided with their drugs in order to help them stay awake and be able to see more clients and increase profits. Um, it is often introduced at a really early stage of a person's exposure in the sex trafficking industry. Not always, right? Because that is not always a thing that a trafficker or pimp uses, but there are often quotas that traffickers act, ask their victims to hit. And, um, they're not really concerned if a victim is sleeping or not. So they're more likely to, to offer these things as a way to make sure that the, the girl or the woman can meet their quota, right? And I also think if I am a person who is being trafficked and I know that my survival is dependent on how much money I make, then I am more likely to, to figure out how I need to make that quota um, in order to keep myself safe and in order to placate my abuser and my pimp, I need to provide this amount of money. And so when somebody offers me a stimulant or something to keep me awake, right, um, then I am more likely to, it's going to be more enticing, right? Because my survival is now linked to that, to that money and bringing that, that amount back. Um, chemical dependency can be used as a pawn to keep victims tethered to their traffickers and is in another element that increases difficulty in escaping their traffickers. The National Institute on Drug Abuse estimates that as many as 80% of women seeking treatment for an addiction have a trauma history. Okay, so a little bit about trauma versus complex trauma. So when we think of trauma, we are thinking of single incident trauma that occurs in one-off events, and it's commonly associated with PTSD, right? Um, single incident trauma can occur from any type of natural disaster, flood, sexual or physical assault in adulthood or from fighting a war. 
And it can also happen if our needs are not being met, right? So like emotional neglect can also be traumatic for someone. So it doesn't necessarily have to be these kind of extreme responses. Um, in order for it to be trauma, trauma is classified by it being unpredictable, unexpected, and essentially trauma is something that uh, is outside of our window of tolerance, right? So it's something that we are not prepared for, that I could not prevent, and trauma is defined by that person's experience. I might experience a car accident with a friend and my brain might consider that traumatic, whereas hers might not, right? So it is, it is determined by the experience of the individual, not the event itself. And the reactions of that are unpredictable in nature, right? But when we think about complex trauma, we want to think about it in the lens of pervasive and continuing trauma. It's chronic in nature, right? So this is not to minimize anybody's traumatic experiences, but really in the context of like, I have only known a lifetime of trauma and it doesn't necessarily be like my entire life is traumatic, but I have had lots of periods of my life where there was no respite from the danger or the threat, right? And so it occurs when there's this repeated cycle that, that if this was my baseline, I have a new baseline because every day when I come home, dad is drunk and angry and yelling at mom. And um, even if there is respite, I am terrified about, oh, why is dad calm now? That's not like him. I'm not sure what that looks like. That actually feels terrifying. I'm used to this person being really abusive. And then I'm experiencing sexual abuse, right? Kind of veiled through all of that, right? So that inability to feel any sense of felt safety from a chronological standpoint is what we think of when we think of that complex trauma. So it includes all forms of abuse, neglect, emotional neglect, the A scores that we talked about, community violence, living in an environment where people do not have their basic needs met and are constantly in a survival mode can be and often is very traumatic for people. Um, racial trauma, right? Trauma, war, genocide, all of those things can be considered that pathway to complex trauma, right? So complex trauma is not always the result of childhood trauma. We have plenty of women who, um, maybe not plenty, but we have some women that report that they did not experience any childhood abuse and their chronic complex trauma starts at a, at a later age in their life, right? It can also occur as a result of adults' experience of violence in the community, domestic and family violence, civil unrest, um, sexual exploitation and trafficking. So the common denominator of psychological trauma is a feeling of that intense fear, that helplessness, that loss of control, right? Judith Herman said that trauma is not the event itself, but the response to the event. Our reaction is to a perceived threat and it is essentially the loss of resiliency in our nervous system at the time of that. So it's an important distinction between single incident trauma, such as a car accident or even a death as compared to complex trauma, which is the compounding nature of that experience, right? Okay. So a little bit about how do we identify, right? Like we've talked about sex trafficking. We have an understanding of what that looks like. Um, some generalities around that, but like, how do I identify if somebody is being trafficked? So these are not end all be all list, right? Sometimes these things exist and sometimes they don't. And it is a pattern. So when it comes to trafficking or identifying a victim, we are looking for patterns of things. Um, somebody was sharing a story recently in another kind of community engagement where someone said, yeah, I saw this person. I was on a plane and I saw this person and she seemed to be very young, maybe her early twenties. And she was with a man who was in his sixties and seventies. Okay. That in and of itself is not enough to say that somebody has been trafficked, right? So just like when we look for patterns of abuse and domestic violence, we are looking for patterns and not just isolated things. One thing by itself does not mean that somebody is therefore now a victim of trafficking. Okay, so some of the things that we can look for is that if the age of an individual has been verified to be under 18 and the individual is in any way involved in commercial sexual industry, he or she is a CSEC victim, right? We know that that is the truth and that most sexually exploited children have been trained to lie about their age. Sometimes a child's appearance can 
um, and their actions can contradict the information they give, but be sensitive to clues and behaviors or appearance that could indicate that a child is underage. Um, personal information might change with each time they tell somebody else or they interact with someone else, and the information might contradict them, contradict itself, right? Because if I am an underage child, maybe I have been taught and told that for my survival, I need to tell everybody that I'm 18 years old, even though we look at that child and we feel, oh my goodness, you are not 18, you are itty bitty baby, right? Um, often a thing that traffickers or pimps will do is not give access to birth certificates or any form of identification. And so a red flag can be if somebody is holding on to that information, will not give that child or not that child, I'm sorry, will not give that adult access to their own IDs and their cards. So if she comes into the hospital and doesn't have any of her identification, but there is somebody with her that holds on to that, right? And again, not by itself, but with these patterns together, um, they can be experiencing some of these risk factors. Physical and sexual violence, um, right? We know that that is the everyday reality of these women and these girls that we serve. And so, yes, they may, they might have visible bruises, but that is far um, less common than we would think because traffickers, what we know is that they are very skillful and they are very smart. And they know that if this person walks around with visible bruises, then that, you know, risks kind of what I'm doing. And so they are more likely to create physical marks in areas that are not visible to you and I. Um, but yes, it can be, right? They might exhibit behaviors including fear, anxiety, depression, submission, tension, and or nervousness. They might exhibit hypervigilance or paranoid behavior, which yes, can be a sign that they are currently a victim and also can be just a symptom of their experiences over time. So sexually exploited children and youth often express interest in or in relationships with adults or older men. Um, they might be experiencing a lot of truancy or tardiness from school. We see that a lot that uh, maybe the youth that we are serving, she starts coming in because she is truant all the time. And then later we figure out with building that relationship with her that, oh, she's going to meet her boyfriend and lo and behold, the boyfriend is her trafficker, right? So any evidence of controlling or dominating relationships can be a sign. Um, constantly, if we are meeting with a youth and they are getting calls constantly, nonstop, where are you? What are you doing? Why aren't you answering, right? And that partner is um, angry or upset by that, that can be a sign. Um, unexplained shopping trips or possession of expensive clothing, jewelry, or a cell phone can indicate the manipulation of an exploiter. This is one of the things that we talk to parents. If your kids start coming home with expensive things or things that you did not purchase, right? That is a something that we need to be mindful of because that can be a risk factor for her, right? If they're not in control of their money, and some of these things apply more for youth than adults, but they can be um, applied in both ways. So if you are not, in, if somebody is not in control of their money, that can be a sign. Any use of lingo or slang from the life among peers or referring, or referring, or referring to a boyfriend as daddy. Wearing sexually provocative clothing can be, but is not always an indicator of sexual exploitation. Um, we don't want to use that as a way to blame victims or monitor what they wear. Um, but it should be noted that not all children in the commercial sex industry wear such clothing. Sexually provocative clothing is not a warning sign in and of itself. Wearing new clothes of, clothes of any style or getting hair or nails done with no financial means to this independently is a more general indicator of potential sexual exploitation, right? So while we are working with youth, we are not necessarily worried about how provocative their clothing is. We are more concerned of, oh, we don't have a financial um, means to supply these things. And all of a sudden we are coming in with new hair, new nails, new clothes, new bags. Those things can be um, a sign, right? And then if somebody is unable to make eye contact, that can also be a sign. A tattoo that he or she is reluctant to explain. Um, we know that pimps and traffickers will often brand their victims, not always, but sometimes. Um, and then youth are commonly branded with their exploiter's name, tattooed on the neck, chest, and arms as a way to um, convey ownership to other people in the life. Um, has an explicitly sexual online profile, excessive 
frequent use of internet chat rooms or specific classified sites such as backpage.com. And that site is known for recruitment. But again, that is not the only site that people use. They're TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, um, Roblox, Minecraft, all these different sites are being used for the use of trafficking and exploitation and to meet um, youth. And then doctors and nurses can consider frequent or multiply sexually transmitted infections, pregnancies, or abortions as a warning sign. And homeless, runaway, or group home children, or we've talked about, are at a higher risk for trafficking and sexual exploitation. Okay, so this is from 2021, just kind of to tell you guys a little bit about New Friends New Life. So I talked a little bit about how we have a youth side and we have an adult side. So youth is from 12 to 22, and then adult side is from 22 and up. So one focus being prevention and the other one making sure that um, women are receiving services once these risk factors have already kind of occurred, right? So the thing about New Friends New Life is that we are a trauma-informed agency. So we very much so believe in the idea of choice. And we believe that relationship is the most important cornerstone to how we are able to impact the lives of these women and these girls. We can have the most information, the most knowledge, the most up-to-date modalities in the treatments, and none of that actually matters if I'm not able to build a relationship with a client. So we try to build community that is at the, the forefront of everything that we do here. And so this kind of tells you a little bit about who are the women that we serve. We know that trafficking and commercial sexual, commercial sexual exploitation disproportionately impacts women of color, specifically Black women and Black girls, more so than it does um, white women or white girls. And so that's kind of shown just by the women that we work with, right? 48% of the women that we serve are Black African-American, 32% are white, 10% are Hispanic, and 3% are Asian or Native American. So that kind of gives you a general understanding of who are the women we serve. Last year, we served 335 women. We already hit that number in August. And so we know that trafficking is growing and we know that people's understanding in the community is growing about trafficking. And because of that, we are able to impact and uh, provide services to more women and girls. Okay. So other ways to help end sex trafficking. So you can follow us on social media, you can volunteer, you can host New Friends New Life to speak at your events. Um, one of the main things that we like to do is we recognize that we cannot do this work on our own. And so we work really hard to partner with different organizations to provide awareness and knowledge out in the community because we know that this isn't a thing that's often talked about. I think more so over the last year, people are becoming more aware of these issues. And so if we are able to be of service to you all at your organizations or just to kind of inform schools or anything like that, we are more than happy and eager to do that. And then also donating, right? Just making sure that women that are experiencing these things have access to tangible resources. So one of the things that we do um, on the youth and the adult side is that when women and youth are engaged in services at New Friends New Life, they're eligible to earn up to 12 weeks of financial incentives because we recognize that when we make the choice to end, um, to, to kind of end this existence and say that we want a different pathway for our life, it is very difficult to do. And it requires so much courage to be able to make that choice and have that thought. And so when women come to us, we recognize that there are huge financial barriers and societal issues that impact why they continue in the life and why they are unable to stop in the life, right? So one of the things that we really believe in is that in order to be part of our program and receive services, you don't have to no longer be in the life. You can still be in the life, right? We just want you to have support um, at any point through that process, right? And so that's not a requirement or stipulation for us. And the other thing is, is that if we can provide them some financial incentive that they can earn, then that will help mitigate the likelihood that they might need to return, right? And so we provide tangible goods outside of just the financial resources, hygiene packs, diapers, formula. We have a food pantry that we can use. Um, we have something called Fashion Friday that we do this really beautiful allow come in and they can shop for items of clothing. So we try to, to recognize that uh, choices aren't made in 
a vacuum. And so there are so many societal issues that are impacting the women that we serve. And while we cannot be the end all be all and we need to enlist the support of other agencies around us, we recognize that we wanna be able to, to meet the needs of our members. And so we just, those are some of the things that we do. Um, and so, yeah, so for the first 12 weeks of our program, when she's coming in, she's trying to get an understanding of, okay, what is this place? Who's my case manager? What does this look like? And then we hold a hundred on the adult side. We hold on average a hundred groups a month. So our program has three kind of legs, if you will. We have counseling, so individual trauma-informed counseling. And then we also have group counseling. And then we have case management. So just making sure that we help link them to access to making sure their basic needs are met, helping them with any benefits that they might qualify for, helping link them with housing, things like that. And then we have economic empowerment. So economic empowerment is all things, money, finances, budget, job. So many of the women that we serve have never had a job outside of the industry. And so we work with them to figure out how to build a resume, to teach them soft and hard skills. We do mock interviews where we have people in the community um, come and interview and give feedback. And so we really want to make sure that they feel as supportive as they possibly can so that when they decide and if they decide that they want to leave the life um, and they feel like they have the resources to do that, then they can make that choice for themselves in a really informed way. Um, and then they also qualify for what we call benchmarks. So as long as a woman is active in our program, we have kind of a list of things that would qualify them for a financial reward, if you will. So if she opens a savings account, she gets a financial reward from us. If she can put $500 in that savings account and leave it there for 30 days. If she gains her first survival job outside of the life, she gets a financial incentive, keeps it for 30 days, keeps it for another 30 days, 90 days, 180 days. If she goes, enrolls in a GED program, if she, um, gets her bachelor's degree, right? So there are all these ways that we know will help kind of build that behavior. And we recognize that people have a financial need that needs to be met in the moment. So any questions, do you guys have any questions for me? I'm gonna to try to, to open it up in the chat. Let's see. Okay. Nancy said, how did they know the annual profit? You know, I'm actually not 100% sure, but all of the research that we get is from Polaris, the Polaris Institute, and they are kind of the um, end-all be-all for researching when it comes to trafficking. And so if that's something that is interesting to you, I'm more than happy to share the link and kind of share handouts related to that. Do you have resident facilities? We do not, that is in our five-year plan, but right now we do not. So we work really hard with the um, shelters around us, with other trafficking agencies to provide um, shelter resources and transitional living and things like that. We also um, have a partnership with uh, Motel 6. And so there are times where when we are not able to get a woman into a traffic, into a shelter, a domestic violence shelter, or somewhere where she needs somewhere to stay tonight, we do have um, some wiggle room to make sure that she can get some temporary housing through Motel 6 for a couple of days. But yeah, the, um, I was reading pretty recently that of all the women that are experiencing trafficking, there's actually only like 700 beds in all of Texas that are specifically for women who are experiencing trafficking. So it's a huge need um, for this community. Residential is a huge need. Anybody else have any questions? Anything about anything I've touched on, anything about new friends, new life, any questions, anything you guys wanna to chat about? Margaret? Yeah, so we, um, 
do speaking engagements and community engagements all the time. We are a nonprofit, so we do not charge for that. We just care about getting the exposure and making sure that people have the access to this information should they want it. How do individuals get referred to our organization? So actually most of the people that are referred to New Friends New Life are actually referred by word of mouth. So women that have already received services from us and they go and they tell a friend um, about our services. Differently on the youth side, um, we have lots of MOUs with different um, community partners. So we work really closely with DCAC. We have um, a partnership with the D Dallas District Attorney's Office, um, making sure that women are getting access to services and any kind of other anti-trafficking agencies that are seeing youth and feel like there is a need and this person is at risk of being trafficked, they can refer a youth over to us. So we get calls from teachers and schools and therapists and parents. Um, we get calls from probation officers, um, anyone that you can think of, but primarily specifically for the adults, it's word of mouth. Um, Craig, I will go ahead and leave you my contact information. My contact information is actually in the next slide. So you are welcome to reach out to me. You guys can also just reach out to, if you just Google New Friends Wife, you can call us and we will get you touched in with the right person. Okay. So yes, Craig, you can reach out to my contact um, or you can just contact us at New Friends Wife and we will make sure that we can get somebody out to do a speaking engagement for you guys. So thank you for asking. Can you provide insight into how to help a teen who has been trafficked and says she wants out of life but continues to exhibit violence and other behaviors that limit it in which facility she is placed? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think if you guys are familiar with the idea of readiness to change, so we know that lots of times, I think even for us, right, when I decide that I want to do something different, I'll say, oh man, I have this goal. I'm going to go, I'm going to train for a marathon. I really want to run a marathon. And then won't do it, right? And that doesn't mean that I don't want that to change. It's that maybe I'm not ready for that change to occur. Um, and so readiness to change is a really helpful tool if you guys are not familiar with it to better understand where the clients and the kids that we serve are at in their decision-making process and that idea of their choice, right? And so what I say is that when a child or any adult is saying that they want something to change but have not yet acted on that change, They, the thing that we can do is continue to be there to support them, continue to let them explore their options, continue to let them know that no matter what they decide, we are here for them and we'll help them in whatever way that we can. And just in that process, providing them that psychoeducation of what's going on, right? Um, and just kind of making that the cornerstone of our relationship with them because the foundation of everything that we do is building a relationship with those girls and those youth. So I think Pam, if you want some more, if you wanna do like a case consultation, I'm more than happy to do that too. Cause I know that this can be really hard to do in isolation and we need to kind of lean into one another to feel like we have that support. So you are welcome to reach out to me if you wanna talk further about that. I know that was really a tiny tidbit. Um, so I'm more than happy to provide that support. Let's see, Cheryl, I may have missed it, but can you specifically speak to the mental health treatment you have available? Yes, absolutely. So we have trauma therapists who work here at New Friends New Life, and um, we provide the trauma therapy in-house. So yes, we have case management, but we also have therapy. Um, almost every single person on our team is EMDR trained because we know that EMDR is a modality that is really helpful for people who have experienced a lot of trauma. And so, yes, they receive that therapy here um, with us and through that group counseling and through that individual therapy. So typically what it looks like is when somebody gets linked into our program in the beginning, they get paired with a case manager and an economic empowerment specialist to make sure that we are getting their access to their basic needs met first. And then once those things are mostly met or they um, reach kind of that level of stabilization, um, then they get paired with a therapist. And so most of the women that we serve have a therapist, they have a case manager, and they also have an economic empowerment specialist. So they have a team of at least three people um, on their side to support them through whatever they're going through and make sure that they're getting access to the things that they need. When I see girls who come into our ER that we believe may be in the trafficking industry, we sometimes struggle to know who all we should be referring to. Sure, of course, Traffic 911, DCAC, New Friends Wife, CPS, Law Enforcement. There seems to be a lot of resources out there with a lot of overlap, but there also seems to be lots of girls who fall, absolutely, fall through the 
crack, if that makes sense. What's the best way to ensure we are getting these younger girls connected to services? So what I will say is that um, Traffic 101 works predominantly with youth, adolescents, and also young girls. So that's a really generalization, but Traffic 901 think younger girls. Um, but the good thing is that a lot of these anti-trafficking organizations work hand in hand. So we have really great partnerships with them and we make sure that these girls are being met exactly where they need to be and with the right agency. And I also think y'all, if you don't hear anything else I say, if you guys ever have a question or not sure, or not sure who to refer to, call us, please call us. We will help you. We will help you figure it out. Um, we know that they're we have really limited in, uh, limited resources in the anti-trafficking field, but what I know to be true is that the people that I've met in anti-trafficking are some of the most passionate um, human beings, and we will make sure that these girls are getting connected to the right providers. If you ever, ever, ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask, um, because yeah, it, it's right. Lots of girls fall through the crack, and the last thing we want is that after a, a, of their whole life is being institutionalized and feel like their needs are not being met, that the ball gets dropped again and that they don't get that need met. So yes, you can call us, you can call the human trafficking national hotline, but if you are aware of the places in Dallas, please, please, please um, give Traffic 911 or New Friends, New Life a call. Um, if you ever have any questions, we're more than happy to troubleshoot with you. The women's retreat in San Marcos, you would be interested. Absolutely, we would love to, we would love to come speak. For sure. Do you have examples of comparable services available for boys, men, and DFW? I'm so glad that you asked this question. So from my understanding, there is now one organization that provides services specifically for men or boys who have experienced trafficking. And the name of that agency is um, Bob's, I'm going to say it wrong. So let me look it up. Ranch Hands Rescue. Sometimes it takes a while. So let me see if I can pull up that contact information for you guys. Um, they are in Argyle, so I'm going to put that information for you all. And then also, if somebody identifies within the LGBT community, Resource Center here in Dallas, um, in the Oakland area, also provides services and counseling services um, to the LGBT community. Ranch Hands Rescue. Um, services for nine four zero two four zero zero five zero zero. Okay, that way you guys can have that. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. How long does someone typically stay in your program? Great question. So because we are trauma informed, because we we recognize that when someone makes the choice to leave the life, it is a very long, arduous process. And there are lots of risk factors that might propel them to re-enter the life. We have anywhere from somebody that is here for a year. And we had a graduate from our program that was linked in with New Friends New Life on and off for 12 years, right? And so it really depends on that person and where they're at in their stage of the process. So there's no kind of typical length of time. We let people take as long as they need to because we recognize that if we speed this, that does not help their success. That actually hinders them. So we let them, we let their process be as long as or, or as short as it needs to be. One thing about our agency is that we have a very high percentage of women that and youth that return, which is a really wonderful thing because we recognize that this is a really hard decision to make. And it is not that easy. It's not as easy as just going to an agency and saying, okay, great, I'm done, right? Because there are so many other things that are happening in the world that can kind of pull her in. And so we are just trying to be here to be a support for her. We try to make sure that they know we're always here, right? And we don't feel some type of way if you leave, we are your support system, we get it, things happen, life gets busy. And so we have a really high percentage of women that return. And I feel really proud of that because um, that just tells me that we're doing what we need to be doing. And we know that that has nothing to do with um, her unwillingness, right? It's just that life has circumstances. And when these people have experienced so much complex trauma, it would be a fallacy to think that after a couple months that 
things are going to look completely different, right? So this is kind of for the long haul. And we don't have like a specific timeline of, oh, you've got to finish in this amount of time. It's not that at all. Locally, do you have a profile on their perpetrators? How are they able to entice these victims other than what you have ex discussed? So I think there's lots of research that talks about the different types of traffickers and pimps. So there's lots of different methodologies and ways that different, um, yeah, different types of traffickers use different mechanisms. Um, but a lot of it is so much of that psychological abuse. Most of the women that we serve have never been chained, have never had a locked door, um, can technically come and go as they please. But the psychological abuse is so strong and so pervasive that the fear of that what's, is what prevents them from being able to leave. Also, when we think about what we know about domestic violence, we know that the research says that it often takes somebody uh, about up to seven times before they are able to actually um, leave that abuser. And so we try to apply that knowledge to a trafficking experience, right? That it is not as easy as like, I just have to walk out of the house and then I'm good to go. And that there's so many other things that traffickers use. Traffickers use um, children against the women that we serve, right? We've talked about how there can be a dependency on drug use created for that need. And I also think at the end of the day, if I am going through this suffering and there are women and people with me that are also going through this suffering, there is a sense of community and kinship that is created. And so there is so much guilt and shame too, that if I get to the point where I'm ready to leave this, what about the people that I love and I care about, right? Like that decision is also a thing that has to be thought about. So there's so many ways. I also think um, the power and control wheel is a huge, it'll tell you kind of the eight most commonly used um, methods that traffickers and also abusers in domestic violence situations use to keep a, a victim kind of in the life. I guess I'm wondering, how do you filter the seriousness of victims? Like they are not just coming to you for, for money or to enable them to do wrong with the money they get. I guess I'm just coming from a background where I've seen for Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we, we recognize that when people do not have their needs met, that um, sometimes it's based in survival and self-preservation, right? So we, we know that lots of the women that we serve maybe are only coming in the beginning for those financial incentives. And we're okay with that. And we know that, but our goal in those 12 weeks when they are with us, earning that financial incentive is to try to build that community with them, build relationship, create a space where they feel safe and heard and seen. Um, our agency is open from nine to 8 p.m. So our drop-in hours on the adult side are from nine to five. And then we also have groups from five to eight. So they can go to different groups. They can also meet with their individual providers. And essentially, um, if you ever have the opportunity to make it to new friends in your life, we have an adult drop-in center and a youth drop-in center. And it's essentially a living room. There's computers, there's TV, there's snacks, there's coffee, there's blankets. There's a little section in the back where they can nap. And we do all of these things because we recognize that in the beginning, maybe, you know, the, the pool is just that financial incentive. Maybe the pool is just the tangible goods. Maybe the pool is just, I need a space where I can go to where I can actually turn off my brain and sleep. Right. We, we know that that is kind of the thing that we're trying to create for them. And also when it comes to financial incentives, they can earn up to $100 every week. And the exchange for that is that we ask them to go to four groups, classes, or appointments. So the goal is, if we know, if we think about the context of readiness to change, um, when someone is pre-contemplative or has not yet decided that maybe there's an issue in their life or that they're ready to kind of make changes for that issue, right? The thing that is most impactful is relationship and is psychoeducation. So if you come in and you're goal is only for these 12 weeks of incentives, that's fine. That's fine with us, right? We recognize that that's a thing because people need to survive. And also our goal is in those 12 weeks, you sit in groups, you listen to information, you build relationships with the staff, you build relationships with these peers, these other women who have had these experiences, right? And then slowly but surely you sit in a domestic violence group and you think, huh, okay, yeah, that applies to me. Okay, huh, right? Like these light bulbs start going off. And our hope and goal is that by the end of the 12 weeks, you want to stay, not because of the financial incentive, but because you start to recognize that there is more that this agency offers than those 12 weeks of incentives. The other thing is 
that we do not um, give any cash or direct money to our members because we know that there is a really complex relationship with money and we, uh, we want to be really mindful of that. And so we only disperse um, any kind of financial incentive or benchmark through a money order. So like if they have a phone bill or it's rent or a storage facility that they need to pay on their storage, we give it also out as gas cards or Walmart cards. So making sure that they get a gift card or something like that. So that way they can use that in the way that they want and they get to choose how that gets dispersed out to them as well. So that that's kind of a little bit about that financial piece. And the same thing goes for any benchmark they get. Um, and we have some benchmarks that if they meet is a quite a hefty amount of money. And so we work with them on empowering them like, hey, how do you wanna save that money? You get to do whatever you want with it, but like, if you have a plan for saving it, here's what you can do. Here's what that looks like. How do we budget that? And also it gets dispersed as money order, gas card, or um, a Walmart card. Also Best Buy, also Amazon. How do you suggest to approach 18 who has been trafficked? And who's a grown up and can take care of herself because she has to do for so long. Yeah, right? Because if I have experienced trauma from an early age and I have been trafficked, my brain goes, when we are born, we are wired for connection. My brain turns that to I'm wired for protection, right? So why, after all of these years, should I trust any other human being when the people who were there to keep me safe are actually probably the people that maybe created vulnerabilities for me, right? And I have endured so much trauma and suffering. I don't trust people. So yeah, of course, I'm not going to be vulnerable and say, yeah, I want support, right? That's that shield that has been created. And so I think the best thing that you can do and really the only thing that we can do in the beginning is to provide that relationship. We know that consistency and reliability breeds safety, right? And so that's what, that is the most impactful thing that we can do in the beginning when someone is saying, yeah, I'm grown. I've only, I've had to take care of myself this whole time. No one's helped me. Okay. I hear you, right? I don't expect people to trust me when they start. I straight up tell my clients, Hey, I don't actually expect you to trust me. I'd be more worried if you came in and you met me and I'm a stranger, stranger and you trust me, you deserve to, to, to wait and see through my actions if I'm a person that is trustworthy or not. And I, I just call that process because that's the reality, right? Um, so many people in protective positions and positions of power have um, used that position of power as a way to exploit and hurt these girls and women. So I just lean into that and call that. Like, you don't have to trust me just because I'm here or I work here, I'm a therapist. A title doesn't mean that I'm trustworthy. You get to scope me out just like you would anybody else. And it is a relationship. And I have to show you in my actions and my words if I'm a person that you can trust. And the only way I can do that is if I'm consistent and safe. Where in Dallas is the center located? So if you guys are familiar with the nonprofit row area of Dallas, we are housed between a, a wonderful number of great nonprofits in the Dallas area. And if you're not familiar with that area, we are by Deep Ellum and also the Baylor Hospital. Do you have services in Fort Worth? We, New Friends, New Life, do not have service in, in Fort Worth. Um, sometimes we, have, uh, we call our, the women that we serve and the youth that we serve members. Um, the members that we serve do sometimes live in Fort Worth. And if they don't wanna make the drive, we link them with Unbound of North Texas they are a really wonderful organization as well. Make sure I got everybody's questions. For under 18, I guess. Yes. For my knowledge, nowhere for under 18 um, boys, specifically for trafficking. Yes, you are right about that, which is pretty disheartening. How do you mean, how do you maintain safety for SAP? So um, we don't feel any uh, fear or threat to our safety when it comes to members, but as far as their traffickers or their pimps or their abusers, we have lots of um, safety kind of built into our building itself. We have um, everybody on their computer has a button that they can click that will notify, um, shut down basically everybody's computer around us and let them know that there's an emergency and something is happening. And it'll tell you like, Rana has requested help or whatever, right? So there's that. We also have security through the building. Um, we have Meadow Security. They kind of own all the buildings around us. And so they are really wildly helpful in that way. And then also we have some panic buttons all around our building to make sure that if something is happening and somebody comes up here, we can click that button and armed police officers will show up. Also, 
we have cameras on the doors. And so our doors aren't open. Our doors are locked. And so it lets us essentially when someone rings the doorbell, because we have three doors, um, when someone rings the doorbell, our front desk um, receptionist sees that and can see who is on the screen and let that person in or not. So that's just some of the things that we have to kind of keep everybody um, safe and keep our members safe too. And I think that that really helps them in a lot of ways by knowing like, hey, as long as you are here, we've got you, you're good. Like we have safety measures and I don't always necessarily like go into all the details of that, but if it is really important for her to hear and feel sure and assured about her safety, I'm really upfront and honest about that of like, hey, we have the locks on the doors that we've got all these panic buttons in all these different places of the building. So like nothing is going to happen. As long as you are here, you are safe. And also what we know about abusers and pimps and just kind of how that works is, um, right? Like it puts them at more risk and vulnerability if they are um, coming up to an, a com community partner and exhibiting any signs of violence or anger or anything like that, right? So that in and of itself kind of keeps some safety too. Do you have services for teens in the CPS system who are approaching 18 to help with independent living? Yeah, so we on the YRC will help a lot of girls that experience that. There is TRAC, which is an agency that's right next door that helps transition um, youth of that age towards that independence. And we also work alongside them as well. So we work to kind of figure out what the case management is, link them to independence. And then so many of the groups that we teach are oriented around that, not just like getting a job, but like how do you take care of yourself? What does it look like? How do you pay bills? What are the things that you do, right? And knowing that so many of those skills are things that we learned as children by watching our caregivers, so much of what we do in this work is reparenting, right? Because these are just skills. I learned by modeling of what was happening in my home. So if there weren't any healthy figures or if my life was transient for so long, who taught me how to pay bills? Who taught me how to like, manage my anger and frustration when I call someone on and, you know, it's customer service and I'm not getting my need met or I feel frustrated by that. Right. So we do so many of those things. And we also hold um, lots of DBT groups. So dialectical behavioral therapy groups, because we know that that is really helpful for people who have experienced a lot of trauma. And so that is kind of a huge part of our, our, our treatment too. Do you have women who come in with their children? Yes, absolutely. So many of the women that we offer services to have children. And so we also uh, provide childcare here because we recognize that we don't want childcare to be a barrier, right? When we say, hey, there's this wonderful agency, you can come in. Oh, but we don't provide childcare, right? We're missing such a huge piece of something that they have to experience day to day in order to make sure that they can, if I want services, what am I supposed to do if I don't have childcare, right? Then I'm eliminated from those services. So we do provide child care and um, anytime we have any like family groups, um, not family groups, I'm sorry, e event programming like parties, we had a Christmas party last night, we always let members bring their kids because we know that healing happens within this family system, right? And so if I want to impact change in her life, I can't say, oh, well, you leave the little ones at home and it's just for you. So we try to incorporate that as much as we can and we try to give them child care. Our child care room, we have a child care room. Um, it really looks like a play therapist's office. And um, we also have cameras in that room. So for mom who has felt a lot of fear in her relationships or felt fearful of what would happen to her children, we let mom know, hey, there's a camera in here. So if at any point you want to come grab a little one or you're worried or you're not sure or you just feel really anxious, we could pull up that camera for her as she's meeting with me in my office so she can see baby at all times, right? So just to, to breed that felt sense of safety. Um, did you have personal doing this seminar in Spanish language as well? Yes, we have um, bilingual therapists. We provide services in Spanish as well. And also, um, yeah, we can provide seminars in Spanish as well. So we want to make sure that we are providing services in the best way that we possibly can. And so we know that there's always room for improvement. So that is one of the things we don't want to miss um, the, the Spanish speaking population. So yes, we have bilingual therapists and case managers here as well. And we can absolutely do a seminar in Spanish. Anybody have anything else? You guys have been so engaged. Thank you so much. Um, I love answering questions. It feels important to, to, to hear what you guys have to say and kind of fill in that gap in any way that I can.
Um, the only thing I'll go over, if anybody else doesn't have any questions, is I touched on a little bit about our program with the district attorney's office, but we have a program with the district attorney's office. And so essentially, Dallas, I think, comparatively to a lot of other cities in the United States, is making a ton of um, intentional choices and decisions to make sure that they are providing support for people who have experienced sex trafficking and that they are not being criminalized for um, abuse that is happening to them. And so Dallas has created a program with us. So if somebody is charged or um, arrested for prostitution, they are able to link in with us, New Friends New Life, and create a small portion of our program. And once they complete that, then those charges are dropped or expunged. Mm -hmm. um, oh, also a huge thing that we do is we got an attorney on staff a few months ago, and it has been the biggest game changer because you can imagine so many of our members have a criminal um, history. And so many of that, uh, those charges happened in the context of the trafficking, right? And whether their trafficker had them get out lines of credit or um, there was drug involvement, it's not just charges around prostitution, right? But the beauty of having an attorney is that if we as case managers and therapists and economic empowerment specialists are working day in and day out to try to get her a job, to try to get her housing, there are so many things societally that prevent her from getting that if she has a criminal background history, right? And so having our lawyer has been really wonderful because she can help with all of those things. She can help with um, family court. She can help with expungements. Um, we had a member a few weeks ago who got placed in housing and it was like a very unlivable condition for her and felt really lost as like, this was the option that was provided to me. And I'm not really hearing back from anyone and nobody really wants to impact that. And so the advocacy from our lawyer able to get her a new place. Um, there's just so many pathways that are opened up if we can address people's criminal um, history and make sure that we have like a legal advocate on staff. So it has been really huge help to to make sure that we are again trying to address all the barriers that we know that these women face um, that continue to impact them negatively even years after they have left the life. Um, also another thing about our program, we know that this kind of work is vital and important and also um, having a person that has experienced what I have experienced and has similar lived experience, is a huge support system. So we have survivor leaders on staff as well. Um, and because there is something that a survivor leader can provide that I will never as a therapist be able to provide, we can know all the information in the world, but it is a different experience to be able to look someone in the eye and say, I get that, I know that, I know what that's like. And our survivor leaders are the embodiment of like, oh, life can look different. Like if she's done it, I can do it, right? And having that encouragement from our survivor leaders is just a, a huge blessing and something that, you know, the rest of us cannot provide, but is so vital for the support in these women and these girls. Okay, anybody have any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, well, that will, we got through that faster than expected. Um, again, if you guys need anything at all, if you guys have any questions, please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm more than happy to be a resource and kind of figure out with you guys how I can be of service. Yes, we do. We host talks in all of the places you can possibly imagine. So if that is something that you are interested in, please, please, please reach out to us so we can um, make sure we take care of that for you guys. Thank you all so much. Awesome. Thank you, Rana. We have some Awesome thank yous coming in. We appreciate you very much. So thank you. Again, when we log off, you will receive a CEU questionnaire. Please fill this out if you're needing CEUs or certificates of completion. And you should get those in five to seven business days. For some reason, when we log off, if you are not getting those, you will receive them tomorrow in your email. So I think that is all. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Rana, again, for being having thank a great you. presentation. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.